Uh, my name is Sean Akins. I'm a singer, songwriter. I'm a baker. I work in New York City. I sell snake oil. Come on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sean Akins. I'm the original creator of Toonami. Oh, how did I get involved in Toonami? Uh, I worked at Turner Broadcasting for a long time. I actually did start off delivering the mail there, and then I got a PA job, and then I got, like, grip jobs and other, uh, like, entry-level positions into production and stuff. Uh, some friends of mine were working at Cartoon Network way back in 1994, and they uh, called me and asked me if I wanted to help create a franchise in the afternoons, like an after-school uh, block for the children. And we worked for a year to create... Uh, a new destination like after school because I was that kid that used to get off the school bus and I would run home to see Voltron or what the fuck ever was on. And I loved superheroes and I loved all that stuff. So uh, I thought I could recreate something like that for kids uh, like me. Stand by for action. I don't know what I've created. The key thing about Toonami originally is uh, it had zero money. Um, so that means you figure out uh, what you can use that is free. And the characters to choose from were the characters that uh, Cartoon Network owned outright, which was the MGM library and all the old um, characters, which is the same reason there's a Space Ghost Coast to Coast and all those other shows, because those characters, we controlled the intellectual property. <laughs> That was a huge driver in selecting uh, Moltar. And if you'll notice, the similarities between the Tom character and the Moltar characters, they both have a visor face, which is the cheapest way that you can really do animation. Clay Croker was the voice of Moltar, who uh, has left us. It's very sad, but he um, worked in the building. He was the voice of Moltar. Super easy um, to make that animation happen. It was, uh, it was about economics, as most things in animation are. For me, and this is just me personally, Toonami was about the collision of things. Not only was Toonami itself a collision, all day you're watching wacky races and oggy doggy, and then at four o'clock, giant robots start cutting monsters in half, right? That's sort of a collision in and of itself. You've got American animation colliding with animation that started in Japan, has had been localized, like we're, not, we're early days at this point. So that was a bit of a collision. And then wrapping that stuff in CGI, also a collision. And then bringing the music to it, uh, like beat-driven electronic music, like hip-hop or dance music, in that world was also a collision. All strong, all brave, all heroes. Just what I need. The greatest thing about Toonami is we were able to, beyond like making a promo that told you this show is on at five o'clock, we were able to do other freeform stuff that was really just our art. You know, we we kind of wanted to make stuff like that, so we just made different things. Man's greatest inventions, making the impossible possible. I think it's best if we team up. I say we go for it, yes! yes. And that gave Toonami a different feeling from the different stuff that you would see, especially on cable. It would just not, people weren't really doing it like that. I think these pieces would come on and you could tell that whoever made this is was into the, con you know, they love this stuff. Um, and we felt that was... Super fun, like that's what we wanted to make. Um, and the fans seemed to like it when we put it on Toonami uh, as well. So we made a lot of mission accepted. So in the beginning we launched with like um, Voltron and Thundercats and these other shows that when I was a kid had come on. So they were really old and we got those for free. Um, or very close to free. And it was just something we could put up. So it, uh, DBZ came on at f like 5.30 in the morning on channel 69 in Atlanta. And kids were setting their alarm and like waking up at 6.30 on Sunday or whatever to watch this crazy show. And then my friends started doing it. So I was watching it. And then you would get bootleg VHS tapes. That was when I thought there could be something here. And if kids are willing to get up this early on Sunday and watch this show, what if we put it on at five o'clock in the afternoon? What could happen? And that's when it blew up. I think one of the big drivers for Moltar transitioning to Tom was we wanted to, to redesign the franchise just in general. It was, it, I think it had been on for a couple years, so we just wanted to freshen up and do something different. But we still had all the same rules. We didn't have a lot of money. We still wanted to go with the visor, all that kind of stuff. So we spent a lot of time trying to develop a concept. And most of our shows at the time were like outer space shows, I think. 
And I was big into creating a place, not, not a real place, but a theoretical place. So I thought a spaceship as a broadcasting center would be a fun vehicle. So it was really finding a way to convince them that we could do it cost effectively. At that point, I had hired a bunch of guys that were good at it. So it, we didn't have to really farm a lot of stuff out. We were able to, um, you know, keep the cost down in that way. And then the stuff looked good. So when you start, you know, delivering animation and material that looks cool and you're not burning the house down, then they will let you do whatever. Intro. So the Total Immersion event, uh, the first one, The Intruder, was really just a fulfillment, we thought, on all the promises that we had made to our fans and to this audience, like going up in it. We, we had a spaceship, like we had our set. And with CGI, it, the funny thing about CGI is even though like none of that stuff is real, it actually is kind of real. So once you have built all of the things, like you still have to build models, you still have to build sets, and it's really just like building them in real life, except instead of hammers and nails, you're clicking and, and dragging and, and deforming. But a lot of work goes into creating all of that. That stuff but then once you have it it's easy to kind of exploit it and you can continue to kind of make additional animation and the more you animation you can make the cheaper all that stuff is if you amateurize your costs over the years I know you kids are big into amateurized costs so that was really how those started we felt like ah there's a way to tell a longer story we can explore our world a little bit more people can find out more about our host character who really kind of was confined to a chair and still is <laughs> predominantly um, and for most of his life. So it was great to get him out of the chair. We never felt like Tom was the reason and the stuff that we were making was the reason that you were tuning in. We always just felt like we were the framework to, to bring it to you. But if there's any way that you could sort of elevate that and give people like just more to react to and more to see, we thought uh, that would be better and that people would like to see that stuff. Go check it out. Hey, go check it out. I mean, it was hectic. Like, we'd never done anything like that before. And, you know, we're talking so many years ago. It was back when we really were like, we can do anything. Yeah, we'll make that. Come on. I'll just stay up for 36 hours and we'll make it. Like, we weren't, we didn't think, we had no brains. You know, you don't think about how hard it is when you're doing something that you love doing. It's like, it's fun. Nothing feels better than creating something from nothing. It's just drawings or it's just ones and zeros or programs, but then you can actually like make another human being feel something. That's super satisfying when you can do that because you feel like, it's this thing that didn't exist, and because of our efforts, or this team, or me, or whoever, we've now brought this thing into the world, and uh, it has affected other people. So it's it's a kind of a magic. You guys ready to make the magic happen? Oh, We're shifting gears into a sadder time. So Tom Four is still the highest technical achievement that the group ever achieved. It's a horrible way to say that, but if you look at the animation, if you look at the quality of those scenes, it's not better than that. It's not better than that anywhere. So what we thought moving into that stage was, man, we now, now we're on we're on top of the mountain. We got a little bit of dough. We got a few guys now. We can take on some bigger challenges. We thought, like, man, maybe we could start making some longer CGI cartoons. We could start doing some longer stuff. To do that, we felt like there's no way anyone is ever going to sign off on a, you know, like a six-minute or eight-minute story of a guy that you cannot see his face. Uh, it seemed like it made sense to me at the time. And it seemed like some of the things that are great in life are people with faces and friends. So, I mean, I thought the work was great. I thought it was super cool. I thought we did a lot of stuff. But, yeah, super controversial. People didn't like it. People thought, you know, not my Tom. Hashtag not my Tom, you know. When you make, like, TV stuff or you, you make stuff for companies like this, they don't come in and they're like, uh, guys, we're canceled today. <laughs> the corporations are a bit more uh, nefarious about that kind of stuff. Uh, so what happens is... There's less resources this year than the next quarter. And so by the time it's actually canceled, it's like it, it's been over for like a long time. The network is always searching, any network is always searching to find a larger audience. And when you think that one day part or one show has sort of 
peaked and the numbers are trailing off, they want to get rid of that and they want to put the next thing on that has a chance to grow even larger. So that's what the network was doing. It was looking for a larger audience, a, a larger audience than Toonami could draw. And then you're arguing about theoreticals. You're arguing about a potential audience and then an audience that exists. So the advantage of a potential audience is that audience is unlimited in size. So it's hard to win that argument and Toonami gets canceled. So until we meet again, stay gold. So it was fun to make it. Um, I'm psyched that it's back. I think it it deserves a place um, in the culture. Um, I think it ushered in the most impactful wave of anime into the United States. It certainly deserves to um, be part of Cartoon Network just as much as any other thing uh, that Cartoon Network made. Uh, and I, I mean, I think it started, a movement is maybe overstated, but I think it started, you know, like it started something. So now, you look at the anime business, which had no place on television, and what? You got Crunchyroll, you got Hulu, you got Netflix, everybody's showing anime. That didn't happen before. Like, you can thank Toonami for that. What you can do, if you like this show, is to watch it. You know, people always would come up and ask me, like, why did such and such get canceled? Why did you take off this show? Do I have to tell you? Like, it's a television show. It was canceled because no one was watching it. That's the way it happened. So if you love it, watch Toonami. And the larger audience that Toonami has, the more power they'll have, the more shows that they'll make, the more stuff that they can bring into the country, and the more stuff that they can show you.